Manchester City are in a dark place right now and those are the words that Bernardo Silva chose to use following the 4-1 defeat to Sporting Lisbon but those words seem to have given license to certain Manchester City fans of a certain age to say things like Pep out. It's an absolute disgrace to hear such a thing but in reality I get it. It's because they're so entitled and so new to the new Manchester City. Forgetting where we've come from. It's like Bain said, you've merely adopted the darkness. I was born in it and that's what many Manchester City fans will say. They were born in it. We're used to it. We do not need to panic to be in this situation. But there are certainly, definitely problems in Manchester City's midfield that need addressing right now. 100% because that midfield has got a, an age problem right now. You look at Kevin De Bruyne, well over 30. Bernardo Silva, the same. Ilkay Gundogan, the same. Three absolute legends of the club. And the connection to Pep Guardiola seems to have been disregarded. They seem to have been separated that City have a problem now and we need to go into the January transfer market. And I've got some players to show you as a result of that as well to, to go through the potential targets and the stats as well as a bonus player. So stick around for that. A bonus a player that's not even in the midfield and potentially as well as some disappointing news that could be linked to that same bonus news. So stick around till the end of the video to find out who that is as well as the fact that Pep Guardiola's contract doesn't seem to be connected to the to the likeliness of transfers because it, it, they're, they're two separate entities. I understand that. They are two separate situations, but in reality, they are very much connected because how do you go into a transfer market with a, an uncertain situation regarding the manager? Where is he going to be? Because these players that we're targeting, we should be looking at four, maybe five-year contract deals. Now, how do you persuade a player to sign a contract with the possibility being that Pep Guardiola is only going to be there for one more year at best by the sounds of it? I mean, if we were to get two more years of out of Pep Guardiola, I think it, the negotiations become much, much easier because obviously from January on, onwards, you've got this rest of the season, you've got next season and the season after that. That is enough tutelage of Pep Guardiola to get most players excited about. Definitely. But if it's only one more year after that and you're signing a five-year contract, you've got four years of like, well, who's going to be the manager? Is he going to want me? What's, he, what's his system going to be? How do you, as a club, approach the negotiations with, with not knowing where Pep Guardiola is going to be? And if they already know, and I have a funny feeling, in fact, I'm almost certain that they know exactly where Pep Guardiola is going to be. And my belief is that he's going to extend, but it, it, we may be proved wrong. From what I'm hearing with, from within the club, he is going to extend for one more year. The timing of that situation is vital as well because these players that are coming in, they're going to want to know. Of course they're going to want to know. And I think that's why City haven't spent big in the last couple of transfer windows. Well, especially the summer just gone because I think we've got a war chest, an absolute war chest, a monstrous amount of money for Manchester City to go and spend. And I think the best thing for the club to do Right now, you might not like hearing this Manchester City fans, but I think the best thing for the club to do is to give that war chest to the next manager to smoothen the transition. Because we've all seen what happens when Wenger left Arsenal, when Fergie left United. Those are the talks that are going on right now. Those two legends at those respective clubs left and things fell apart for a bit. Very much so at Manchester United, a little less so at Arsenal because the transition was a little bit smoother. But at United, it was a disaster, an absolute disaster. And they're still recovering now. They're still on the decline, actually, if anything, with Ruben Amarim supposed to be their saviour. But look how long. We're talking a decade, a decade of problems Manchester United have been suffering with. We can't afford to do that. So while it might not be great news to, to lose for the next year or so, I would much rather the next decade be a success, wouldn't you? I would definitely give all the tools needed to the next manager. And that's why these transfer deals are so difficult for Manchester City to get over the line. And arguably, who do we even target? And how do we persuade these players to come and join and be Pep Guardiola for one year and then the unknown mystery man for the next three or four years? How do they know what to do? I don't think it works like that. And this is why I think Manchester City will have to factor in that in this January transfer and the next summer. And depending on Pep Guardiola's location, that will deem our... our uh, uh, severity in terms of the, the the dealings that we enter into going into the summer transfer market in particular, where City are talking, we're talking about Musiala, talking about Verts. They're going to want to know. They're going to want to know exactly what's what at that football club. But the three names, I'm going to go through them now that Manchester City could be targeting in January of this year. Let's start with the first one. Obviously, everyone wants to hear the name. Martin Zubamendi, an absolutely sensational player. I think the connections have become obvious. From a comedic point of view, it would be absolutely hilarious to see Liverpool fans crying at the idea of Martin Zubamendi signing a contract for Manchester City after he rejected them in the summer. But, I mean... 
he's already come out and said he's going to be at Real Sociedad. So I think City fans need to get over it in January. I think we need to recognise that unless things have drastically changed since October, when he said that he's going to stay at Real, Real Sociedad, which is, what, a month ago. These comments are a month old that he said he's going to stay at Real Sociedad for the foreseeable future. I mean, he has got a release clause of 60 million euros, though. So City could trigger that and really test the waters, see what he's all about, see if he's actually going to be committed. But it's his boyhood club. Um, the next player I'm going to get onto is Edison. Again, 25 years old, same as Martin Zubamendi, Brazilian. He's entering into the peak of his career, being at such a that peak age of 25. is almost like the perfect age for a midfielder. Uh, his contract, just like Martin Zubamendi, ends in 2027, but there is no contract release clause in that deal. But he's got a current market value of €40 million. Euros. Uh, again, the statistics, I'm going to be providing them for you shortly as well, so stick around for that. And then the third player is Samuel Ritchie. He's 23 years old, so age is a massive factor in that one because you've got two years on the other two targets, which is huge. At 23, you're still just bordering on the edge of a little bit raw still. Still so much to learn, you know? And I mean, would he be an understanding of a, being an understudy to Rodri for the next couple of years until he reaches his peak when he reaches 25, 26, Rodri's entering his 30s and Rodri's career would start to be on the decline a little bit as Samuel Ritchie starts to be on the up and up. So there may be a little bit of a passing of the torch there between these two players. But again, it's age is a massive factor for the Samuel Ritchie potential deal. Uh, 28 million euros his market value is. His contract expires in 2026. So a little bit easier to get over the line, barring, barring the Zubamendi contract release clause because it's 60 million. So... He's uh, been getting into the Italian squad lately as well. But, right, that's the three players that Manchester City are targeting in midfield. But what does City need? What do we need in midfield? You know, we're, we're hearing so much talk about the defence is shit. That's the words everyone seems to be using. This defence is cooked. It's shit. Like, that's it. But why? Why? It's because we're getting hit on the transitions. So many opportunities for the opposition have been just so clear-cut, the clarity of their chances. It's not the number of chances we're giving up, which it doesn't suggest a defensive problem. It's, it suggests a systematic problem. A problem with the fact that the way we attack is actually the problem. It's not the way we defend, because individually these defenders are getting exposed. Because, yeah, there's no one protecting them in front of them. And the fact that we give the ball away, one second later they're in on goal. And you're saying the defence is shit. Nah, that, that's the, we're giving the ball away in such dangerous areas, as well as the, the openness of the system just makes us so vulnerable. And I've got some stats to prove it as well, so stick around for that. But looking at the fact that what our current circumstances are, we're, we're talking about recovery runs, getting back quick. So, you want speed, surely. If you want to get back and prevent these and get players back into position, as much as it's uh, very much a midfield role is all about up here, positioning yourself correctly so you don't have to sprint, more often than not, our, our midfield's having to sprint. We've seen Rodri having to sprint back to his own goal. And while he's not known for his speed, he's certainly not slow. And in fact, that's one metric that very get, rarely gets measured. There aren't many statistical providers out there that can actually give you these numbers in terms of speed. You know, but there are some, and as you can see here, so let's start with Zubamendi. His top speed, which was clocked at the Euros, is 29.4 kilometers per hour. That was his top speed, which is concerning for me, very concerning. So there is clearly a lack of speed to his game. If you compare that to Rodri, who in the same tournament was clocked at 33 kilometers uh, per hour, which is a substantial difference in speed. Okay, so there is no denying the, the elite level of technical ability that Zubamendi has. Going forward and his control of the game, he's not even weak in the tackle. Uh, physically, yeah, he doesn't win as many duels. Defensively, a little bit. He's okay. He is strong in the tackle. But his speed is something that we very much need at Manchester City because we are getting hit on these counter-attacks where you want these recovery runs. The, the likes of runs that we saw Mateus Nunes do in the Wolves game before we went and won the game. Seconds before that, Mateus Nunes getting back and winning the ball and sending it going back the other way. Moments like that, if that's what you want, Zubamendi ain't the guy, unfortunately, because he ain't got the speed to get back. But will he use his nous? Will he use his noggin to get into the correct positions where he doesn't need to use his speed? He's a fantastic player in all departments except some of the physical departments, which, again, an area we worry, were struggling with. And the speed, again, struggling. So you look at Edison, top speed. This is in the Champions League. His top speed's been clocked at 32.62 kilometres per hour. So not quite 
as fast as Rodri's 33, but you compare that to Kovacic, who's considered slow. We talk about Kovacic and say he's slow. Well, his top speed was 31.68 in the Champions League this season, which is two kilometres faster than Zubamendi. So, again, highlighting the lack of Zubamendi speed, really a concern for me if we're going to be targeting that area of the pitch. And Samuel Ritchie, unfortunately, there are no speed stats out there for Samuel Ritchie because it, Torino, who he plays for, they're not in the Champions League this season and he didn't participate in the Euros either, which is the two areas where I could gather this information from. So it's unfortunate. So we have to use the eye test for Samuel Ritchie. And those who have used the eye test, like myself included, he does not look slow. He doesn't look slow at all. But what's the rest of his game like? I think we should be focusing on the defensive stats, in truth, because while all three players are different in their respective ways. There is subtle differences between all three of these players. What we're concerned about as City fans is the leaky defence that we have. It's, it, that's what we call it, a leaky defence that we can't keep clean sheets. And while the defenders are getting the blame for it, I feel like it's the players in front of them that could have a big say in, in, in our vulnerability to conceding goals. So if you have a look at these defensive stats, so what I've done here is compare six players, some players that we've been linked with in the past, and obviously Rodri uh, and players that we are currently being linked with uh, that I'm mentioning in this video as well. So I wanted to look at their defensive stats from 2022 to 2024. So two, and a, two seasons and a bit basically is what I'm looking at here. And the reason I've picked that amount of time is because Samuel Rich is in there, who's 23 years old. So I feel like if we start dipping into his youth academy stats, it skews the stats completely. So this is first team football from the last two and a half years, effectively, there or thereabouts. So tackles one percentage. Let's start with that. Samuel Ritchie. Wow. Wow. Really, really impressive. Doesn't tell the whole story, though, so stick around. Uh, Samuel Ritchie is, is comfortably. He knows how to win a ball. One-on-one -on -one duels seems to be incredibly, incredibly strong. That's definitely a strong aspect to his game. With Rodri, alarmingly at the bottom of that list, Okay, so that, that's a bit concerning, but I, I'll get on to what Rodri does bring Manchester City and why we don't worry when he's in the side. So moving on to the next bunch of stats. These are interceptions per 90 minutes. Declan Rice being at the top of this list. Uh, Edison, Zuba, Mendy, Gimenez, and Rodri again near the bottom, but Samuel Ritchie shoots all the way to the bottom. So interceptions, certainly not his strong point. Edison, really, really good, reading the game very well, understanding the opposition's game really, really well. And Zuba, Mendy up there as well, not bad at all. Rodri still near the bottom. Okay, so you're like, whoa, how, why, why is Rodri near the bottom with all these stats? And I'll tell you why. Because tackles won per 90 minutes in the attacking third, which is the circumstances Manchester City are more often than not at their most vulnerable when we're in their half. And the counter-press, as it's known as, winning the ball back high up the pitch, not at the other end of the pitch. Look at those numbers there. He is comfortably above everybody else, Rodri is, in the attacking third. So while we have the ball in their area, or at least on the edge of their area, we lose the ball and then win it back quickly. Something that Sergio Busquets and Xavi and Iniesta were so renowned for, and Barcelona and Pep's Barcelona of those days, were winning the ball back so quickly. Rodri's top of this list Again, re a reason why we don't get hit on the counter-attack is because they don't get the opportunity to counter-attack or transition, whatever term you want to use, for the fact that Rodri's winning the ball back so early and so high up the pitch. Brilliant from Rodri. And Samuel Ritchie, again, that's more a, a reflection of Torino, as is Zuba. Oh, in fact, all three targets are bottom of this list and, and very little between them in terms of 0 0.1817 and 16 between Edison, Zuba, Mendy and Ritchie for tackles one per 90 minutes in the attacking third of the pitch. Whereas Rodri's miles ahead. So, yeah, I think that's a, a, another indication of what Rodri brings to this team and why we don't uh, concede too many counter-attacks or transitions from the opposition side. Um, but again, you look at Edison from Atalanta, Zubamendi, Real Sociedad and Ritchie for Torino. The three sides that they play in will be a factor as to where they position themselves on the pitch. They're, they're not champion. Well, Atalanta are, but Torino and Real Sociedad, no European football to speak of. So, I mean, they, they are middling teams. They're not going to be a, a, as attacking, as forthright as the likes of Arsenal and Manchester City, which is why Declan Rice and Rodri are so high on this list. You wonder whether they can do it in a Manchester City shirt. That remains to be seen. The next point I wanted to make, ball recoveries per 90 minutes. Rodri is just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous figures that he's putting up there. Sensational. With 8.28 per game. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Well above Declan Rice. 
and Gimares again, two sides, Arsenal and Newcastle, you'd think that, yeah, but it, it's just another indication of how absolutely brilliant Rodri is. Richie again, is at the bottom. Could that be a reflection of him himself or Torino? Probably the latter. Same for Zubamendi and Edison. But the point is, really, the sides that these, these three players play in, it indicates the the difficult jobs that they have in defensive midfield. But one thing I will highlight is Edison never plummets to the bottom of the list. He does seem like a well-rounded player. So I do think if you look at the three players out of Edison, Zubamendi and Samuel Ritchie, you look at Zubamendi as a technically gifted player, sensational on the ball. His his ability to... He's strong in the tackle. There's no denying he's strong in the, in the tackle, but he doesn't win as many that he enters into. His ball recoveries are not that high as well. So I, I, I feel like... As an attacking defensive midfielder, if that makes sense, Zubamendi is probably the better technically gifted player on the ball, carrying the ball and things like that. A vision for a pass. I think Zubamendi takes it out of those three. I think Samuel Ritchie, defensively, we've seen with his tackles, one percentage, it's clearly a strong point to his game. One-on-one -on -one duels. The fact that he's 23 gives him a license to have the excuse of, well, I've got plenty of years left to learn. He's growing in the game. He's getting better and better. So it's, it's harsh to judge him it, playing in Torino um, in a club that's not exactly challenging on many fronts, is it? So defensively, I think he's the he's the answer. But the the most well-rounded player is Edison. But is he a jack of all trades, but a master of none type of player? You know, because we kind of need a player that's elite. We're talking about Rodri, and that right there's the problem. It's why I'm struggling to pick out of any of these three. Zubamendi for me would probably take the cake just because of the experience that he has, the fact that he's played alongside Rodri. I think that he probably has an ability to understand what Pep Guardiola wants. Which, is, which I think would be vitally important. But is he thinking about, well, is Pep even going to be there in two years? Which is a whole problem to the whole transfer system right now at Manchester City. And why we can't just splash the cash in this transfer window, or probably not even in summer, depending on where Pep's going to be, is a big factor. Who would you pick out of those three? Because I think it's, it's a difficult call to make. I really do. Because I think there's a case for all three, but very differing reasons as to why those three players, one of the, each of those players could bring something different to Manchester City. But ultimately, they're no Rodri. None of them show signs of Rodri. They're not anywhere near the level of Rodri. And that is our ultimate problem, is Rodri's just a ridiculous, ridiculous player. And another indication of why this guy won the Ballon d'Or. Uh, fools who don't understand the game and only think that, that goals are what matter are the reason why you think Vinicius Jr. should be, should be the Ballon d'Or. This guy, mate, this guy is the reason Manchester City is struggling right now. It's because he's not in the side. Look at the difference he makes with the stats that he puts on the board. He is a dominant, dominant figure. And City rarely lose when he's in the game, you know? Bonus transfer news, because reports are coming out that Jack Grealish could be on his way out of Manchester City in 2025. That's what I'm hearing. I hope not. But with the news that I've heard lately that Manchester City were targeting Rodrigo of Real Madrid, which would be incredibly exciting and a replacement for Jack Grealish. But the rumours are that City were tempting the, the waters, testing the waters with Real Madrid looking at over 100 million euros. How far over 100 million euros? I don't actually know. But the point being is that uh, not Jack Grealish, of course, leaving the club would be a big blow for me. I think he's a, he's a quality player that I think we're missing right now. But you talk about Rodrigo, I feel like he's another level. I feel like he's another level to Jack Grealish. He's going to bring the goals and assists that Jack Grealish tends not to do. Um, he's obviously a big admirer of Pep, Rodrigo as well. Again, same conversation I've been having all video, really, isn't it? Well, if he's going to sign for Manchester City, he's going to want to know where Pep is going to end up in the next year or two. It's the same problem. It's in the underlying problem that the thread that goes through all of our transfer deals is where is Pep going to be? What do you think, Blues? Get in the comments below. Let us know your thoughts. Like and subscribe to Typical City, and I'll see you in the next one. 